means that I have to uh, I, I have to leave by 7, 7.05 max. So if there are questions, otherwise. Um... Yeah, uh, we could take some questions. If anyone has questions from our audience. Okay. Uh, if not, uh, I would like to ask you some questions. Okay. <laughs> So um, I, I, I was really interested in your research. It was really great. And I really liked your presentation. It was such great, uh, um, how do you say, simplification for the student. I really liked the analogy about the new technologies that are the gen new genetic sequencing technologies. Um, so I was going to ask you, like, what got you interested in the field in the first place? And uh, and yeah, so what got you started into the field? Yeah, it was quite, um, there, there's a combination of things. I, I, I got into medical school to, to do neuroscience. So actually, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I know much from here down. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I am a doctor, but um, I was very, very, very focused and very, very interested in the brain um, from a very early age. Um, when I went into end, I decided to do um, my residency in pediatric neurology and psychiatry because I loved the development. So the brain development is very fascinating for me. And uh, at the myelination, that's where I get, I got into white matter, is a process which is, uh, in my opinion, one of the most interesting. So how the myelin get deposited into the brain is fantastic. So uh, that's where I was attracted by that. But then the really, uh, the reason why I wanted to do this was that I, I met some patients I, I got actually, um, it, was, it, it was not my choice at the beginning because it was my uh, residency uh, director who said, you will be the one working on this disease. And it was a very rare, it was this, the name of this disease is called Icardi Gutier syndrome, uh, is another very rare disorder. Again, we are talking about 500 patients worldwide. But what really appealed me was that I was not talking about numbers. I was talking about actual patients with names. And in my thesis, um, I knew all the patients. So it was a, a possibility for me to uh, merge my interest for neuroscience with uh, the interest for personal relationships. So, uh, and even now for me, I mentioned that uh, the, the partnership with patients is very important, but really because I think that when you do research, uh, either in medicine, in neuroscience, in pharmacology, you really need to keep in mind what's the goal, who's the ultimate person who's benefiting from that. And that is the patient and that not only the patient, but families. Um, so that's, uh, the, and rare diseases allows you to do that because you really, you're not talking about millions of people affected. You're talking about very specific patients, um, with the names. Uh, so yeah, yeah, that's it. Definitely. I think, uh, with the, uh, with rare diseases, you can connect more with patients and yeah. hear more about their stories. Um, I also wanted to ask you, um, from your perspective, what would you like to see more um, in the rare disease field about, for example, like the attitude of clinicians towards patients or uh, from the government or from yeah. communities? Yeah, um, uh, it's very quick. The answer is consideration. Mm -hmm. um, because uh, that's exactly the same type of reaction again. Um, they all talk about the numbers. So, um, for example, at the beginning, when we were doing these white matter rounds, uh, there were 
many other clinicians and scientists participating, not necessarily interested in that. And as soon as they heard that that condition was very rare, some of them were quite dismissive saying, okay, but what's the frequent, how frequently I will see another case of, like that in my career. And to me, the approach is the opposite. It's like that patient counts as much as a patient with stroke. For sure, stroke, we you will see thousands of strokes in your career. But is this a reason for that patient to be neglected? No. Uh, and the same applies to uh, government, of course. So uh, government are talking about numbers, are talking about money, are talking about funds. Um, so we really need to change our attitude, uh, not just to say, or also because um, we are going into uh, personalized medicine in every field. Rare disease is already there. Rare diseases, we are already working basically on a personalized type of approach. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, that's what I would like to, to see more. Yeah, thank you so much. Definitely, uh, as much as we deal with uh, general diseases, when we deal with like rare disease patients, anything we do we also their lives counts as much as the, the yeah. next one also yeah. their condition is just as uh important to their life as any other condition yeah also because as i mentioned in my talk and and then i stop um, but um, it's not that what we are doing for them uh, is beneficial only for them there have been many i can make you some example but there have been many general advancements in science that have occurred thanks to rare diseases. Because rare diseases in comparison to complex multifactorial disorders are easier to be studied for some way, some reasons, you know. So uh, really, it cannot just be discarded or neglected simply because it's rare. Yes, definitely. So uh, I think uh, with your talk, we have really seen the, the great importance of rare diseases, not only uh, for clinical advancement, but all, also for scientific and technological advancement. So thank you so much. Uh, oh, thank you. We're a little bit pressed on time, so I'm going to give the floor to Ms. Ashley Ferreira uh, to talk about uh, patient outreach. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yushi, and thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lapiana, for that amazing presentation and really uh, helping show what it is, um, uh, talking a little bit about rare disease, what it is that we have to see and really the science advancements. Uh, with that in mind, I'm going to speak a little bit more about the patient side. So I'm going to go ahead and start my screen share and we will get going. Okay. Beautiful. Are you able to see my scene, my screen okay? Yes. Excellent, excellent. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much to the IPSF for inviting me here today. I'm very excited to share a little bit about my experience with you all uh, working with rare disease patients. Uh, just a little bit about myself. I have worked in the nonprofit sector for over 10 years, uh, specifically with rare disease patients. I've worked with them for about five years. Uh, majority of those rare disease patients coming from the primary immunodeficiency population, which I'll speak a little bit. Uh, I currently serve as a community partnership manager at Picnic Health. Uh, we are a health tech company, and I'll also speak a little bit about my work there and how it relates to rare disease, patient uh, advocacy, and so forth. Uh, I always like to share that I am a caregiver, and so as a caregiver for for, uh, my mother and my siblings who suffer from different uh, illnesses, one of them being a rare disease. Um, I understand the importance of patients being able to advocate for themselves, caregivers knowing how to advocate for their loved ones. Um, and with that, I am an advocate for patients advocating for themselves. I believe that patients should be their best advocates. They should be empowered to own their health. And uh, a lot of my work has really been making sure that patients feel like they have the tools that they need to be their best advocates. Um, so I have had the, um, the fortunate opportunity to work with the Immune Deficiency Foundation, where I served in various roles, uh, primarily focused in patient education for individuals living with primary immunodeficiency. 
Um, at the Immune Deficiency Foundation, uh, the organization is dedicated to improving the diagnosis, treatment, and quality of life of people affected by primary immune deficiency uh, disease, diseases through fostering a community empowered by advocacy, education, and research. Three principles that uh, Dr. Lapiana definitely uh, touched upon in her presentation. Um, IDF seeks to ensure that everyone in the U.S. affected by PI has uh, the tools that they need and the understanding of their PI diagnosis, how it affects them, all of the available treatment options, the expected standard of care, um, and opportunities for connection and support within the PI community. Um, so what are primary immunodeficiencies, right? Before I get more into my work with IDF, I wanna explain what that is. So primary immunodeficiencies are a group of more than 450 rare chronic conditions uh, in which part of the individual's body's immune system does not function correctly, or some of them even lack a, uh, an immune system. And so a lot of time, these individuals suffer from severe infections, uh, a cold where you and I might get over a cold in a week or two, they suffer much longer, usually be a month. Uh, unfortunately, the average time to diagnosis for individuals with PI is seven to 14 years. And really it's because unfortunately, medical professionals aren't really aware of what a PI is. Um, actually, you'll see on my screen that I have uh, the IDF logo that says think zebra and a zebra. So individuals with primary immunodeficiency are often called uh, the zebras of the medical world. And the reason for that is that uh, doctors in, um, well, they are in medical school students and they're in medical school. They are often told that when they are treating patients, if they hear uh, hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. But at the Immune Deficiency Foundation, we think that doctors should be thinking about zebras. And the reason for that is they have to look for, maybe for individuals with PI, for example, they often have to think about those rare conditions, something that they wouldn't normally think about. And usually that's how these individuals are diagnosed. Uh, I will say that there are forms of primary immunodeficiency that are now um, diagnosed at birth. And that is because of newborn screening, uh, which IDF was part of advancing, such as for SCID, which is severe combined immunodeficiency. Um, but working with these individuals, what I've really found is that patients often feel isolated, alone, and afraid. Um, fortunately, with proper medical care and treatment, many patients with PI are able to live healthy and independent lives. But unfortunately, if they aren't diagnosed, they don't have that opportunity. Um, or even if they are diagnosed, unfortunately, they don't necessarily receive the resources that they need to understand their condition. Uh, often, they don't necessarily connect with other patients who suffer from these similar uh, conditions. And so unfortunately, their diagnosis um, journey, not, not just their diagnosis journey, but their journey as a patient, it, it is alone. And so there are wonderful organizations like the Immune Deficiency Foundation out there who really have the opportunity to provide education so that they understand their condition and they can advocate for themselves. Uh, working with these individuals, I've also found that patients often tell us that they want to work with their medical team. And so in the spirit of what we are here for today, I definitely want to emphasize the, important of, the importance of working with patients, understanding, listening to them. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this later on in my presentation, but every patient's journey truly is unique. And so it's important for medical professionals, whether they be physicians, registered nurses, uh, pharmacists, it's important for them to really listen to their patients. It's important for them to understand that these patient journeys, again, are unique, that not, um, you know, not, it's not one size fits all. Often with treatment, you know, we mentioned that I, uh, PI does not have a cure, but it does have treatment. Often these patients have to change their doses significantly um, because they realize that they need more medication or less medication. A lot of them are treated with immunoglobulin. Uh, it, it really is a process. And so it means that the medical teams really need to be able to communicate with each other and with patients. Patients want to work with them. They want them to understand. And unfortunately, some of the 
some of what we hear from patients is that they often feel like their doctors don't listen to them. Um, they'll give them prescriptions without providing them the education. And again, that's why they feel afraid because they don't understand their condition. And, and of course, this isn't necessarily every case, but we do hear this quite a bit. And so that's why, again, it's important to also work with patients to empower them, make sure that they have those resources, those education materials. Uh, you as a medical professional, you probably won't have all the answers and that's okay, but maybe you can refer them to the resources that they need, like other nonprofits, like the Immune, uh, the Immune Deficiency Foundation, like the Jeffrey Modell Foundation. There's definitely resources out there. Part of my work with the Immune Deficiency Foundation also included working in the spec in the field of DEI. And so what that means is I was responsible for leading DEI efforts in our patient-facing programs. Uh, what that means working with patients such as through support groups or developing education programs, I had to ensure that the organization incorporated some of the basic principles of diversity, equity, inclusion. Uh, additionally, we worked in cultivating new patient communities and programming that targeted underserved patient populations, specifically the Latinx community. We know that they were an extremely underserved community, especially in primary immunodeficiency. And so we wanted to ensure that we were providing them with resources, that we weren't necessarily just helping only one subset of the population. It's about being able to help all of those impacted with primary immunodeficiency. And what I will say, it was truly amazing seeing how incorporating these principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion, such as translating education materials into different languages, such as Spanish, um, Portuguese, Mandarin, um, also providing different support groups, especially in those uh, socioeconomic areas that were different from our traditional groups. So uh, again, underserved communities, it made a difference them being able to connect to others from their own communities, whether it be based on financial background, whether it be based on race and ethnicity, they were able to communicate with others who understand the journey that they were going through. Um, and of course, this really helped the patient understand their condition and understand that they weren't alone. And that leads to a better uh, quality of life. But before I continue speaking a little bit more about this, I do want to make sure that we briefly go over what is uh, diversity, equity, inclusion in healthcare and why is that important in rare disease? So diversity essentially means understanding different patient uh, backgrounds. So medical professionals should work to understand the backgrounds of patients that they serve, including uh, different factors such as race, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, age, disability, and socioeconomic status amongst other um, characteristics. Equity, when we're speaking about equity in healthcare, uh, equity ensures that patients are treated fairly through medical practices, processes, and policies, regardless of identity or background, what we were talking about with diversity. This means that giving patients the care they need when they need it, that does not vary in quality because of a, a patient's background or status. Um, and then we come to our final component, inclusion. Inclusion means giving patients from all backgrounds a voice in providing and receiving high quality care. So this act starts with encouraging a diverse, uh, uh, encouraging healthcare professionals to speak with their patients, give patients a voice in their care and treatment. And so talking, thinking about what Dr. Lapiana shared and thinking back to what I had mentioned, patients want to be involved in their treatment. They don't necessarily want to just go to uh, their doctor and be told, go on this medication. They want to understand what is going on. They want to understand if that treatment would be right for them or if they're experiencing side effects that they are able to communicate that with their doctor. Uh, if they receive certain medication, they want to know that they can speak with their pharmacist about some of the potential side effects or things that they should look over. Um, medical professionals, including pharmacists, really are key in helping tackle some of the biggest health disparities within healthcare. This includes understanding the barriers that patients are faced with. Um, and, and really, th this is a key thing about DEI, right? There are barriers there. 
these barriers include cultural language and socioeconomic barriers. Um, I personally grew up in an underserved community um, and was witness to the significant disparities faced by patients. There were multiple times where a patient's quality of life was really impacted because they were victims of the aforementioned barriers, um, such as not taking their treatments correctly because they were uh, because they weren't able to communicate in the same language with their pharmacist or their medical doctors about their medication or what their condition is. Not going to the doctor because their physician rolled their eyes at them because of their cultural beliefs and how that impacted their care or just really feeling like they weren't in a safe space. And so that's why it's important for medical professionals in any, in any area, right? Pharmacists, physicians, nurses, to understand that DEI is so much more important um, than it's originally been in, in the healthcare space. And so it certainly is uh, picking up quite a bit. There are many healthcare facilities, organizations that are really trying to incorporate this, but we all need to be active participants in this. So again, making sure that we understand there are diverse backgrounds, trying to understand what those backgrounds are. Where are you working? What, where are those patients coming from that you're going to see? What are some of those cultural barriers that you might face? Do you actually um, have you spoken with someone in that community to understand some of those barriers that you're going to see? Again, equity, patients should be getting that same care. Regard, we should work on breaking down these barriers regardless of their background to ensure that they are receiving equitable treatment. And then inclusion, all patients should be involved in their medical treatment in their journey. Um, they might not necessarily always agree on everything, but it's a matter of working together to ensure that that patient has a better quality of life. Um, this becomes even more important in rare disease where patients struggle with even reaching a diagnosis. As I mentioned previously, those with primary immunodeficiencies, unfortunately, it takes them anywhere from seven to 14 years to be diagnosed. And a lot of times it's because they don't see the, the doctors that they're supposed to see. So for example, here in California where I am located, uh, and there's a high Hispanic population, many patients unfortunately will go to the emergency room. Uh, instead of going to see a regular doctor and they'll go because they're faced with reincurring infections, severe fever, uh, different symptoms, which they should go to the doctor, but they don't necessarily follow up with going to an immunologist who is really the one who treats primary immunodeficiencies. Uh, they also aren't included in the decision-making process. Again, this could often be a result of a language barrier. The doctor will just give them their medication, offer very uh, superficial patient education, which doesn't necessarily help them. Um, and this, again, doesn't create a safe space for rare disease patients. And so even thinking outside of primary immunodeficiency, I worked with uh, patients in other rare disease areas such as myasthenia gravis, uh, PVC, PNH, and they have shared the same experience where they go to doctors, um, they haven't been diagnosed and they often feel like their medical team does not listen to them. Unfortunately, there have been instances where some say that the doctors will brush them off and tell them that they're exaggerating, but once they continue their journey and really advocate for themselves, they reach their diagnosis and they're oftentimes able to live a more independent lives depending on the condition and how advanced they are. But what I would like to say here is this is why it's so important for medical professionals while they are studying to remember it's important to keep these principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion in mind when they are studying and when they plan on working with patients. We certainly um, want to make sure that these patients are taken care of, that it's not too late when they finally receive their treatment or their diagnosis and that know that they have a safe space, that they are able to communicate with their medical team. And so now I actually work in the health tech uh, sector as you see had mentioned. So thank you so much for that. And what I do is I currently work as a community partnership manager. Uh, what that means is that I work with different patient advocates. I also work with different advocacy groups, really those who directly involve themselves with uh, the patient populations so that we can ensure that they have the proper um, resources that they need. And so Picnic Health 
it is truly a company where helping patients is central to our approach. Uh, Picnic Health essentially works in two areas. The first area being electronic medical records, the second being research, uh, specifically real world data research, which I'll talk a little bit next on the uh, on the next slide. Um, but when it comes to electronic medical records, Picnic Health works to provide patients with access to their medical records so that they can own their health. So those, uh, I will say that Picnic Health is currently a, a company that works with patients in the United States, who knows, maybe we'll eventually expand, but right now it is just with US-based patients. But what we do is we work to provide individuals with their electronic medical records in one easy to access place online. They are able to see all of their records. Uh, they are um, able to see their notes from their doctors, their lab results, imaging, so that they can truly become educated and advocate for themselves. Again, I'm very big on patients advocating and feeling empowered to be able to ask questions. Uh, when it comes to patients being able to access medical records, we know that this means that it can lead to them having better care, better lives. Uh, research shows that patients and caregivers having easy access to medical records uh, tend to have enhanced doctor-patient communication and continuity of care. Uh, there's more informed decision-making by both parties, uh, increased patient engagement, which is wonderful because they feel like they really are a part of their care. As we mentioned, patients want to be a part of their Care. They don't necessarily just want a treatment. They want to know that they are making the decisions with their doctors to ensure that what they are doing is best for them. We see that there's improved health outcomes. So again, better quality of life, which is often important to these uh, patients. So Picnic Health again says, own your health, advance medicine. And that's because the next area that we work in is in real world research. Uh, these are some of the conditions, the rare conditions that I currently work with, myasthenia gravis, MG, uh, PNH, PBC. We actually also work in multiple sclerosis. Uh, we've been fortunate to be able to work with patients. Um, part of my role also involves working with our patient ambassador programs, which again really emphasizes the importance of making sure that patients are involved in research, that the patient voice is not forgotten. Um, I have the unique opportunity of engaging with patients and listening to their stories so that researchers can truly understand what is important to these patient communities. What are those research questions that they really care about? Is it so much about finding a cure? Do they know that possibly a cure in their lifetime is inaccessible, but they really want treatments for better quality of life? Or what, what are some of the things that we need to to consider? Are there certain symptoms that we maybe didn't think about? Um, how about actual diagnosis? Are there possibilities for being diagnosed early? That's what we want to know from our patient populations. What is it that matters the most to them? Um, and also user research. So what that means, again, being in the position that I am, I get to speak with patients to understand all of these important questions, but ensure that what we are doing truly impacts them and makes a difference. Next. So what is real world evidence? As I mentioned, Picnic Health also works in research and we work in what we call real world data research. And so what real world evidence is, is it's healthcare information derived from multiple sources outside of typical clinical research setting, which includes electronic health records, claims data, um, disease registries and data gathered by personal devices and health applications. Again, we work in electronic uh, health I'm sorry, electronic health records. And so what's really wonderful is that through real world evidence, which comes from these electronic health records, which are anonymized, we ensure that our patients' uh, privacy and information is protected. We anonymize all of their records to ensure that it is safe. They never have to worry about having anything that will go back to them or identify them. We want researchers to know that their journey is unique. And so through real world evidence, through these medical records that patients consent to donate certain data points, they're able to show that their unique patient journey matters, that there is so much more that we can see outside of clinical trials through their medical records. Um, 
what's the buzz about power, you know, the power of real world evidence? Well, again, we can obtain data without the biases and constraints of traditional research clinical trials. Um, we are able to include a patient population that is far more representative of unselected patient population than those of research clinical trials, um, including patient groups that so oftentimes are excluded. There are, for example, cases where individuals are not able to participate in clinical trials because they're asymptomatic. They don't, uh, they don't meet all of the criteria. Well, with what we do with real world evidence, we are able to include a more representative population. That also means that we're able to incorporate DEI principles and have more diverse data sets. So for example, there are individuals who aren't able to participate in clinical trials because of those barriers that we spoke about. A lot of them socioeconomic, uh, geographic barriers. So with real world evidence, them being able to contribute to research through their medical records, we are able to get them involved in a way that they didn't think they would be able to before. Um, and finally, uh, real world evidence studies can complement and in some instances replace traditional research clinical trials leading to significant cost savings. We will say that Picnic Health, what we really hope to do is really complement a lot of these research clinical trials and help serve as a bridge between researchers, between patients and, um, and healthcare professionals. And so I mentioned this for a few reasons. One, you can see that we're continuing this concept, this theme of making sure that patients can advocate for themselves, but also make a difference for future generations. So not only are they going to better be better educated by having access to their medical records, but they have the ability to make sure that their voice continues in research, that they're making a difference, and that really they're the ones who are leading the way for these medical advancements in conjunction with medical professionals, with these researchers. I also mentioned this as, uh, if for those of you who are interested in pursuing careers in research, this is an area, possibly an opportunity that you can get into. So please make sure that you look at all the options that you have available. Um, I do see that we have about three minutes, so I will try to go through the next slides quickly. Um, so I, again, brought up my work with Picnic Health. I'm sorry, you usually, did you have something to, to add? Oh. No, it's okay. I just wanted to let everyone know that uh, if the meeting ends once again, uh, you can rejoin with the same link. So there's no rush there. Perfect. Thank you so much, Lucy. I appreciate that. And I am going to make sure that I copy that link this time. Um, beautiful. So again, continuing, patient-centered research and treatment matters. So we know that incorporating the patient voice into research and treatment of rare disease patients, uh, by doing this, we help to remove some of those barriers that we discussed earlier and really work towards providing rare disease patients with the answers uh, that they want with the tools that they need. And so through patient-centered research and treatment, we know that we're able to raise awareness and help overcome stigmas. We're able to find better and faster ways to diagnose certain conditions earlier, again, helping with those long diagnosis journeys. We help better understand and find more effective and targeted treatments. And we help doctors, not just doctors, all medical professionals better predict the progression of certain conditions. So again, it's important to keep the patient at the heart of what we do. Uh, the role of pharmacists in rare disease, right? So what, what is your role? And the, the reality is, Pharmacists really have the opportunity to partake in a patient's unique journey in a very unique way. Um, they have the opportunity to provide personable care in ways that some physicians might not be able to, in the sense that you are responsible for staying up to date on new approval drug safety warnings and medical literature. And when you're explaining to the patients what it is that they should be taking their treatment, what side effects they need to keep in mind, what other uh, medications they should or should not be taking at the same time, that is something that you are able to communicate with patients. And so when you're communicating with them, again, cultivate safe patient environments by incorporating DEI principles that we discussed. So trying to remove some of those cultural barriers, some of those language barriers, ensure that they are being involved in their treatment. If they have questions for you, answer those questions. Try to see if you can help them. That's very important. And really, it, they rely on you 
um, in a lot of these cases, they know that you're the expert and they want to work with you, the experts. And of course, we hope that you will consider becoming involved in research and help pave the way for medical advancements in rare disease. It takes a village, that's certainly true. And so it's not just patients, it's not just doctors, it's not just medical professionals, it's all of us working together and collectively so that we can make a difference. And then I see that we have a minute left. So I'll stop sharing and I'll go over my last slide um, in a moment when we leave. And then hopefully that will that will end my presentation there. Yes. So I will try to start uh, the meeting once 